So it seems like integration at a high level involving systems that are agentic requires consciousness. Well, what's special about this form of binding? All right. So now we have this continued contrast approach. This is a descriptive, naturalistic approach. Here we have the integrations that involve consciousness. There's Descartes' pain. Then we have ventriloquism, McGurk effect, pupillary reflex, and the control of smooth and motor control and muscle. What's the difference between this and this? These guys and these guys. It turns out the difference is not a level of control. It's not a level of complexity. It's not semantics. It's not a level of feedback. These things you find in both. I thought it was semantics. I thought when you're carrying a hot of food, you know it's bad and that you don't get that from the unconscious one. There's unconscious semantics all over the place in the brain. So what's the difference? Again, it's not controllability, complexity, feedback, memory, semantics. Well, the difference is that in the conscious conflicts, you have different systems that are trying to guide one specific effector in the body of many effectors, and it's the skeletal muscle effector or the striate muscle effector. When the conflict involves skeletal muscle, you are conscious of something going on. So this is captured by the, the term that John Barge came up with. I can never come up with a beautiful term like this, prism, parallel responses into skeletal muscle. This explains when a conflict or integration in the nervous system will perturb consciousness or not. The account is unique because it explains why intersensory conflicts are unconscious, why smooth muscle conflicts are unconscious, why you are conscious of the Stroop effect conflict. You see the word red written in blue, you have to say blue, you feel the, the conflict. Holding your breath, your conflict, you're conscious. And it explains why voluntary muscle why skeletal muscle is voluntary muscle. Skeletal muscle is quote unquote voluntary muscle because it's an effector that is guided by systems that when in order to influence it, they use these bizarre states we call consciousness as a, mes as a method of integration and communication. So, stimulus, stimulus, sensory, sensory, that could be unconscious. Stimulus response could be unconscious, like responding to a subliminal stimulus or reflexive pain withdrawal. This is what's always conscious. This is holding your breath or the Stroop task. You have two streams of stimulus response ongoing at the same time. In the Stroop task, you have to name the color in which the word is written. It conflicts with word reading. Holding your breath, carrying a hot dish of food. You have to go to the restroom, but you can't go because you're giving a lecture. All that stuff is called integrated action. So the neurological evidence makes sense. Neurological evidence, the actions look irrational and like they're not taking information into account because they are unintegrated actions, but we're talking about one effector system. So unintegrated action is withdrawing your hand from the hot stove. So you don't need consciousness to withdraw your hand from a hot stove. You need consciousness to keep touching it for some kind of reward. You may say, oh, it's just suppression. No, integrated action is also if you breathe faster because somebody's going to give you a hundred bucks to do so. So it's not just suppression, it's cross-modulation, two systems influencing skeletal muscle at once. Now we're going to do the experiment. Everyone release all the air in their lungs. Now don't inhale for a few seconds. All right, inhale, inhale, please. No one pass out. Okay. Did you feel an urge to inhale? Raise your hand. All of you did. In my experiments, I can't use statistics. I have no variability. All right, name the color in which this word is written as fast as you can. Red. Now do it again. How many of you felt the urge to say blue? Again, it can't do statistics. What's that? Oh, you said blue. That's, that's actually, um, the, that's called environmental contamination in psycholinguistics. All right, now here's the anti saccade task. Look, or let's do the pro saccade condition. I'm going to show you a fixation, and then the circle's going to pop up on the screen randomly. Look at where the circle is. That's the pro saccade condition. And now we're going to do the anti saccade condition. Look at the opposite side of the screen. How many of you felt the urge to look at it? Again, now, this is really important. When the two systems give you the same action plan, look left, look left, say red, say red, you're unaware that two systems are at play. So when the action plans are harmonious, 
you not only know they're harmonious, you may not know two action plans are at play. When they're conflicting, then you say, oh, there were two processes. So the fights between the ego and the id is because of the conflict. If the ego and the id are aligned, eat the cake because it's tasty and healthy, then you may not even be aware of it. That's called synchrony blindness. When the action plans are... So not only does the account explain why you're aware of certain conflicts but others, it explains within the skeletal muscle system when you're not aware of the conflict. So... Here we have the Stroop task. You have strong response conflict. You need conscious processing. Also, uh, holding your breath. Or we did an experiment where people were in the scanner and they were told to prepare to go left or right, like a goalie would be. And they reported these subjective perturbations. So you get it even when there is an action expression. If you sustain incompatible skeletal muscle expressions, you get these strong conscious effects. If it's smooth muscle conflict, you don't get them. If it's harmonious action plans, you don't get them. So the pro saccade condition is similar to the Stroop congruent condition. And you get the effects with just basically telling someone to point left and right to prepare. If you're interested in all this stuff, the theory came out in Psychological Review a few years ago, Marcella Psychological Review, and there's a meta-analysis of all the evidence. It came out in Neurocase. Um, so it turns out that skeletal muscle is a bizarre effector system because it's a very multi-determined effector system. Eons ago, the superior colliculus and other really low-level subcortical areas told the skeletal muscle, do this, do that, when you see the cake, eat it. And then you have these other areas that are phylogenetically newer that start telling it to do different things. So the struggle of the parts problem in evolution, how do the different parts work together, is particularly pronounced for skeletal muscle because you have different brains telling it to do different things at different times. In this descriptive account, Consciousness is the physical state that solves that problem for the brain. It could have been solved unconsciously. We can make a machine that solves it unconsciously. The artificial heart is not anything like the biological heart. Artificial locomotion, walking, is nothing like wheels. Right? So evolution, for some reason, used this bizarre form of communication that involves integration and some kind of broadcasting, and we don't know why, how this system works. We don't understand what it is. So what is the difference between conscious and unconscious integration? People are now looking at the neural correlates of integrated actions versus unintegrated actions. Guess what you find over and over? More widespread regions for integrated than unintegrated. People are now looking at the frequencies. Is it more gamma? Is it more this? Is it more that? The work by Logothetis is very important. The work by Lawrence Ward at the University of British Columbia is very important uh, to answer these questions. So skeletal muscle is a steering wheel, and conscious states function like a Wi-Fi system within the brain to make the different users of that steering wheel interact. When you knock out the conscious state, you can use the steering wheel, but it won't be in an integrated fashion. It'll be just dropping the hot dish or inhaling reflexively. So we don't know what consciousness is. We're trying to explain how it falls within nature. One can say, well, consciousness doesn't do anything, but when people say Huxley's steam whistle, the sound it makes doesn't do anything, we know what the steam whistle is, we know why it makes a sound. We have no idea what this thing is. It's a form of communication that's very fast. We haven't built anything that has it. We understand how the lungs work conceptually. We can't build the lung, but we don't have an inkling regarding how this form of internal communication for integration occurs in the brain. But I, I will say this. If the heart is like a pump and the nephron in the kidney is like a filter, then consciousness is like our everyday broadcast systems, but it's a form of broadcasting and information integration and communication that we just don't understand at all. So in several studies, we have examined the cognitive signatures and neural signatures of conscious versus unconscious conflicts and integrations. Regarding conscious conflict, we looked at a lot of interference paradigms like the Stroop, but we also did, people used to criticize me, all your conflicts are innocuous and they're not like the conflicts of everyday life. We actually did the cold presser task where people put their hand in freezing water and they're conflicted because they want to withdraw their hand from the freezing water. We did that task only on ourselves, though. We did, only the experimenters did it because I couldn't put subjects through that, although we had IRB approval to do it. And I've done the cold presser task. It is very, you can't habituate to it. The water keeps moving. It's really bad. Um, and you're in a state of conflict. 
it turns out that the research by Ward and Logothetis, it may not be that area A has to be activated and area B be activated for you to be conscious of something. And maybe that A and B have to be interacting in a certain way. We find that a lot. In binocular rivalry, whether you're conscious of the face or of the house, is not just activation areas, it's not the loci, it's the manner in which the loci are interacting. So you will have area A and B activated, but the frequencies connecting them won't be in the proper range, and then you'll be unconscious of it. When A, area A and B are activated and the frequency range are in a certain area, then you are conscious of it. So this is an evolutionary-based descriptive account. This is like trying to find out how a, a dolphin achieves echolocation, how a bat achieves echolocation. Uh, it need not be this way. Um, people say, well, you know, everything you said I could instantiate in a neural network. And I said, everything I said I could instantiate in 50 neural networks. But that's not the way evolution came up with this problem. So this is a bottom-up descriptive approach. We're unconscious of peristalsis. We tend to be conscious of pain. Why? We're unconscious of the McGurk effect integration. We are conscious of holding your breath integration. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. There's time.